afternoon. Welcome everybody. My name is Diane Sawyer. I am the president of the Reedsville Chamber of Commerce and we are really excited to be here uh, wrapping up our sessions that we have been doing uh, over the course of the summer. Our topics at 12 on Thursdays uh, that has been presented by the uh, Small Business Center of Rockingham Community College and our representative there Susan Reagan who's the director of uh, the Reedsville Chamber, Team Reedsville and Rockingham County Economic Development Office. Um, we are really thankful for this collaboration. It's a lot of folks have been behind the scenes pulling together resources for small business. So thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to turn it over to our presenter. Today we're going to be discussing lending for small business and it's presented by John Colasar with BB&T, um, now Truist. So welcome and John, take it away. Diane, thank you. I appreciate you and uh, Susan for allowing me to do this today. I think it's vitally important, uh, especially in the state of our economy today with how COVID-19 has basically changed all of our lives and uh, especially our small business owners. You know, there's a lot of people that are doing um, fairly well out there right now and there's others um, in the entertainment space that are really struggling. So um, hopefully this will give uh, small business um, people the opportunity to know what the financial institutions are looking for whenever they're going to apply. Next slide. Uh, lending to startup businesses. Uh, there's really two different areas that you can go into. You can go to your local bank and financial institution to get a business loan, or you can go through the government process, which is uh, SBA lending. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is uh, just take a moment and just define the um, startup of a small business, the way the financial institutions and the government look at small institutions or small businesses. It's businesses that have been in operations for two years or less at the time of a loan request. Next slide. Uh, I also would like to inform people um, the triad uh, biz, this is their information. They're saying that in the startup businesses that go out there, 50% of them fail because of incompetent experience, uh, especially online fraud and uh, lack of experience in the industry. 80% uh, of businesses that fail are predominantly cash flow driven. So just because you're really good at your craft, um, you know, you could be a hairdresser, a plumber, and you could do a really, really good job at what you do. But if you don't have the business side of it, um, it, it makes your uh, business more challenging. Uh, so I would highly recommend that you uh, take a class or two on the business side and really understand the industry going into your startup business. Next slide. One of the key factors uh, when you're starting up a business, uh, I highly recommend uh, three things that you do right off the bat. And it's actually part of your organizational structure. Um, you need to find a very good lender of choice that you feel comfortable working with at the financial institution that you may bank at or that you don't bank at. Uh, the second thing I would do is advise yourself with a good CPA or an accountant that can help you with the financial structure of your business. And then lastly, I would try to find an attorney uh, that can help you with the organizational structure of what type of business that you want to become. So not only do you need to know your craft, but on the business side, you need to know how you're structured. So I have a few here for you to uh, see. You can become an S corporation, LLC, PLLC, a sole proprietor, or a C corp, just to name uh, the most common ones that are out there. The difference between the two uh, in bank financing and SBA financing, I'm gonna walk you through the bank financing piece. That's the piece that I'm most familiar with for startups, but there's also a SBA uh, process that I'll go through at the very, uh, towards the end of the uh, 
presentation here. But when you have bank financing, the approval comes through the bank only. It's not required to go through the uh, Small Business Administration. Next slide. The information that you will need uh, when you're applying for a small business loan is we're going to need a personal financial statement. And when you go through and you receive a personal financial statement, I just want to give you an idea of a few things that are on that personal financial statement. So they're going to ask you your name, your social security, your address, uh, birth date, um, the name of your business, the street address of your business. And then they're going to ask you um, some, some key information that goes along with that that's going to help us make the lending decision. And I'll go through that on the next slide. But you also need two years of tax returns. If you are a startup business, less than two years, we'll need your last year's business tax returns. Uh, we would like to know your past experience uh, in the field. Um, just because you started up the business, did you work 20 years in that business? Or is this just brand new? Uh, we also would like projections that if you get this loan, how are you going to repay the loan back? So we ask for uh, one-year projections. And then back to the last slide, when I'm asking you about your, um, your structure of the organization in the X, uh, S corporation, LLC, or so forth. There's also a taxpayer ID attached to that um, that identifies you through um, the federal tax department of uh, what identifies that particular business. Next slide. So the personal financial statement. In a personal financial statement, uh, it's a list of things that we would ask you, and one of them would be, how much cash do you have on demand? And what we mean by that is, what's in your checking account? What's in your savings account? Uh, personally, not in the business, personally. If, if you're a startup less than two years, then you'll also have, hopefully, business cash as well um, that we would add somewhere else. But on the personal financial statement, we're just asking things on the personal side. And the other things down there as well is, you know, what type of life insurance do you have, uh, marketable stocks and bonds, uh, closely held business. So just because you're starting up this new business doesn't mean that you don't have another business that you already um, have formed and it's in existence, but maybe you're not a complete owner. And in this particular business, you want to be a complete owner and you would list that business and your ownership that you would have. Vehicles, real, real estate, uh, investment accounts that are on the retirement side, like 401k, IRA, so forth. And other assets would be like the other assets that are in your home. And then other loan payables is what I like to call that. Those are like credit cards and things of lines of credit that you have um, personally in your personal name. Next slide, please. The business loan application. The business loan application is a vital part of, we want to know what is the purpose of the loan so that we're able to structure your loan process co correctly. So what do I mean by that? Say that you're uh, an existing business owner less than two years and you are wanting to buy a building instead of work out of your home. Well, we would put that structured piece in a loan instead of a line of credit. However, if you buy that building and you want to do some upfits to it, then we may would attach also a line of credit to that so that, you know, I know that the estimate is 15,000, but I would like a line of credit of 20,000 to do the things that I would like to do. And we may have overages and shortages, and I don't want to pay on something um, interest like a loan that I get all the money up front. I'd rather have a line. And then the last bullet there is what is it going to be used for? And I just kind of went through the two scenarios of a loan and a line. Next slide. Concerns and hurdles for most of small business owners 
uh, it really comes down to understanding the business side of it. There again, uh, you're very good at your craft, whether you're a plumber and going out to the house and fixing the problem, but you may not really understand cash flow. And that's really where your banker and your accountant will kind of help you through understanding the cash flow of when you get paid and when your obligations are expected to be paid. And then, of course, you want to get paid. And that is kind of a short circle to a cash flow of you doing a job and, you know, you're out the money for doing the job. And then you obviously need to live and get paid. And then actually when the customer pays you, that's kind of a short triangle of cash flow. And other hurdles are understanding your competition and what you're entering into, products and services. How are you going to get the products and services uh, that you need in a timely manner to be able to do the job quickly? Uh, in home and out home, actually this has become a really, really uh, essential in the COVID-19, you know, because you may choose to do something like uh, staying with elderly people or staying with people that are um, requiring you to go in the home uh, right now. So one of the hurdles that we're seeing with some of our uh, existing business clients is, you know, what do you need from an in-home or out-home of understanding that and how COVID has impacted it? So next slide. Bank approval. So when you're going through this, um, the bank is taking on 100% of the risk on a business loan. So you need to make sure that you're very methodical and that you have um, a good plan and process in place. And one of the key ingredients that I alluded to early is to make sure that you have a good attorney, an accountant, and a banker, and these things come a little bit easier in the bank approval process because each one of them will lend a hand in the process to help you get approved. Next slide. So if you look back at small business in a startup instance, you're, you're seeing that it really relies predominantly on your personal finances your personal finances and how you paid them in the past. And maybe if on your personal financial statement, if you're able to attach something personally on the collateral side, then that helps you get a small business loan early on in the process. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the personal side is so important in the decision-making side for a financial institution. So that lends me to the small business lending piece. And what this is, and I'm kind of defining this in my own terms, it's a partnership between the bank and government banking finance. So this is where um, it's vitally crucial that you bring all the things to the table when you, whenever you're applying for an SBA lending, because now you've got two people that you need to satisfy. Next slide. So why would you choose SBA lending over bank lending? And there's a few reasons why. Maybe you don't have the collateral personally or in your business. There's a shortfall there and we may would use government financing through the SBA lending arm that would provide that for you. Or maybe that you don't have enough money in your business account for the down payment of 15% to get the small business loan through your bank to get the 85% uh, percent financing and 15% down payment financing. Or maybe the terms and conditions uh, really don't match up with your cash flow, and you might need to extend the term of a note which is outside of the lens of what the financial institution is willing to do. They'll approve you, but they just can't do it through the terms of conditions of what they're doing, and SBA can sometimes go out longer than what a bank would. 
or it could be your experience in the industry. Say that you are um, today, uh, you work in a manufacturing uh, facility of some kind, but you've got your cosmetology license now and you want to go into cosmetology. Maybe the financial institution just don't feel comfortable enough for you making that transition based off of your personal finances of making that jump into your new career. And we might need some help through the SBA to get you through that point. So that's what those bullet points really mean there as far as why you might would choose SBA lending. Next slide. SBA requirements. So since it's a partnership between the bank and the government, then all the information that you filled out for the bank, which I listed earlier in the slide of this presentation, um, we would use that information, but then there's some other things that you would be required to do from the SBA side. The SBA requires you to do a more in-depth vision plan, uh, business plan than what you might would have to do at your financial institution. And in that are a few areas that I'd like to kind of go over. The executive summary. That would be a snapshot of your company uh, explaining who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and who would use those uh, services. And that needs to be about a page, page and a half of, an, of explaining your business. The other part is the business description and, and uh, vision. We want to know what, or the SBA would like to know what the mission, vision, and your values and goals and objectives are. And then a brief history of the business or, or business experience that you have um, in that. Definition of the market. Making sure that you understand the business industry that you may be entering into or a business in industry that you're already in, but you want to own your own business, making sure that you understand that industries because all industries are a little bit different in that, you know, some are just nice and steady. Some have peaks and valleys of when they do a lot of business and when they don't do a lot of business. And I take our retailers, you know, our retailers, you, you, if you're around Christmas time, uh, the retail market just explodes because everybody's out shopping um, right before Christmas. So I would say late October, November, and the first part of December, the retailers do really, really well. Well, unfortunately, when January and February come, our retailers don't do quite as well uh, because everybody's paying back that money that they spent majority of the time for Christmas. So that's an industry uh, cycle that kind of has um, ups and downs. Uh, so you would need to know uh, your market. The products and services, uh, you know, that's really, you know, go back to a plumber, uh, products and services. You know that you got a supply chain, and especially right now in uh, COVID-19 that we're dealing with, you know, how long does it take me to get what I need in order to uh, help my customer? So products and services, you know, where am I going to get it? And then how am I going to service it? Uh, we would want to know a complete picture of how you're going to execute that through the SBA uh, lending. Organization and management goes back to uh, earlier in the slide of the structure of your organization. So are you a S corporation, um, a LLC, a PLLC, a C corp? They would wanna know um, that structure. And if there was any special licensing or permits that allow you to do what you do, because that would be barrier of entry things, which would be very good for you. Um, for us to know uh, whenever we're doing SBA lending. Marketing uh, strategies, um, really would like to know, how are you gonna market yourself? Are, a lot of people today, uh, especially in the COVID world, they're doing it through Facebook, uh, all these other 
uh, social media strategies that they're using. Some people still use uh, brochures and things of that nature to get uh, the information in people's hands. Or, you know, one of the best strategies is word of mouth. Uh, people that know that do, you do good work and you're just going out on your own, word of mouth can be some of the best advertising in the world is that, you know, for me, take me for instance, is that, you know, hey, John's going to go out there and uh, open a bank or something. You know, I don't, I'm not going to do that, but I'm just saying, you know, word of mouth could be the best way of uh, advertising as well. And I skipped one up there, management. Uh, management is crucially uh, important that the SBA understands what type of management experience that you have or that you bring to the table, or quite frankly, what you might not have, uh, so that we're able to understand you know, how your organization is, is going to be ran. Uh, financial management, uh, I will go more in depth in the financial management piece on the slides to come, but really the last thing that really differs outside of traditional bank lending and SBA is the SBA application. You will be required to also do an SBA application, um, pretty much a lot of the same information that your business loan application had on it. Um, you'll be required to do an SBA application for them. It's just on uh, their letterhead and their information. Next slide. Financial management for new businesses. Uh, one of the things that both the bank and at the SBA requires is estimated startup cost. We need to know how much is it going to cost uh, to purchase a building or to start your business and so forth. And the things that we're going to require is projected balance sheet and projected income statement uh, for one year forward of what it's going to look like after you were to get um, that loan. The other thing which is very important is projected cash flow statement um, for 12 months. How is that loan going to be repaid? And whenever we do this loan or line, how will that help you with uh, making additional money to be able to pay back the loan? And with the regular bank, we only need 12 months of cash flow uh, statements month by month. But the SBA requires another two years annually after that. Like if you were to get one today, we would want to know the next 12 months through middle of 2021. And then you could give a breakdown monthly. And then you would have to do an annual for the next two years for 2022 and 2023. Next slide, please. SBA approval. A lot of people think that whenever they get an SBA loan, the government was the only one uh, that approved the loan. That is not correct. Both the SBA and the bank, based off of the request, have to approve the loan. So next slide. And this is why. The SBA risk associated, um, you can see here that the government is taking a lot of the risk away from the bank. But you can see in a partnership, you have to get both approvals because in most instances that I see, it's either this breakdown. The government will take on 90% of the risk and the bank will take on 10% of the risk. And sometimes they'll do an 80-20 where the government takes on 80 and the bank takes on 20% of the risk. And majority of the time, it is on the bank's books uh, that this loan or line of credit would go on. Next slide. Okay, well, that is uh, pretty much my presentation today on for startups between the different lenses of your financial institution and going through the uh, government financing piece. And what I wanted to do now is just kind of open it up if anybody had any questions on um, either one, whether uh, going through your traditional bank or going through the SBA lens. So, John, I had a question that came through the chat um, that was asking about explaining the timing 
for a bank loan versus an SBA loan, application to receipt of the funds, and the typical versus extended. So just kind of all of those pieces, how it works. Okay, well, that's a tricky question, and I'll tell you why it's tricky. It really just is based off the um, request. So I'll give you an example. Say it's a piece of rolling stock, and it's a client that would like to uh, purchase a van for their business. Uh, I can do a business loan for a van within 30 minutes to an hour uh, on the bank side. Obviously, if you have to go through the SBA, um, that process would take two to three weeks. Now, I want to kind of give you more of a, a, a realistic um, timeline. Let's say that you're purchasing that building that's a little bit longer of a timeline anyway. Uh, so if you're purchasing a property, uh, the timeline traditionally for that through the banking, you would probably get in three to four weeks. There's a lot to do. You gotta do title searches. Um, you gotta do appraised values. You gotta do um, a lot of things in the process that traditionally through the bank, it would probably take three to four weeks. If you were to do that same loan through the SBA, uh, Diane, you're probably looking anywhere between five to six weeks just because you got that extra step. And you got to remember the bank is only taking on 10 or 20 percent of the risk and the SBA is taking on the other 80, 90. Did that answer? I think it did. I think it okay. did. And I think a lot of people are really confused. So this is going to be helpful because um, the pandemic brought on so many um, questions about lending where people were looking for help and you had the PPP and then you had the EIDL and we did specific webinars on those and um, you know EIDL money existed beforehand and the SBA existed beforehand but some people didn't know about them until the pandemic it was like you know it brought to light the SBA and some of the options that they do. So I think it was really good to talk about just traditional like bank lending and SBA lending for businesses all the time, not just during the pandemic. So um, I think this is a really good topic. I think that that covered, um, you know, some of the, some of the differences that people need to understand. And I have another question um, that came in the chat box about how a non-traditional business startup, such as new media or internet based, what steps that they would need for that sort of lending? You, you know, um, I got to be quite honest with you, Diane. I, I have done very little uh, media online uh, business startups, uh, but it would traditionally be pretty much the same. It, it you know, it just requires um, a full disclosure of what you're really trying to do to get that startup business started. So, you know, if you've got an equipment list for that startup business, if it's through um, servers or uh, laptops or whatever it may be, um, we would need to really know the full understanding of starting that business up so that we can kind of help the business owner um, figure out a way to get that lending process. And I'll be honest with you, Diane, in Rockingham County, I've been here since 2006. I've done very little of that. I've done very little media, um, that, that type of uh, industry uh, lending, to be quite honest with you. So that may would be something that I would need some help on. Okay. Um, and I think that you still covered you know, the question, and I think you'd be able to help them. Um, one of the questions, another question that came to the chat box was um, discussing credit and yeah. how businesses can improve their credit before going to the bank if they're trying to, to build towards that. And I think um, that's something a lot of businesses still don't understand how, how that correlates. There was a question about that. Well, the first thing that I would do is, uh, there's two options uh, to really get started. The first option would be the free credit report. You can go out there um, to the website and just uh, Google free, free uh, credit report. And the first thing is understanding what is on your credit report. And then the other uh, conduit is Credit Karma. 
Credit Karma is another service that you can go to and get a free credit report or one that is fairly reasonable and pull your credit. And the key is, Diane, is understanding what is on the credit report. So what do I mean by that? When you go to the free credit report or uh, Credit Karma, they're going to tell you what your trade lines are out there under your name. And as you know, as I've shown uh, through this small business lending, especially for startups, your personal credit is key in order to get in a small business loan. So understanding what's on that credit report, you normally have two categories. You have uh, revolving, which a revolving would be maybe a line of credit, a credit card, or so forth. And understanding that utilization of that line has a lot to play with what your credit score is going to be. So if you have a $5,000 credit card out there and you've got $4,998 on that card, you have very little revolving credit left to get access to. And that actually impacts your credit score. So one of the first things that I do is that I make sure that they understand that the utilization of a credit card or a line of credit is very critical because the amount that's out there actually hurts you. Below 50%, it's a very, it, it's not that big of an impact on your credit. So you go from a 50% um, or less utilization, that means on that $5,000 card that you have at least $2,500 or more on that. And the other one would be installment loans. And that's more traditionally your auto lending loans, your home loans, and those loans are where you have fixed payment options. So you have your house and say you paid $100,000 for your house and you're paying 4% on it and you have a $700 payment out there. So I don't know if it's 15, 20 or, or 30 years, but it'll tell us that. And what you do there that's crucial is that you don't have too much owed out on your, your installment loans. And what I mean by that, based off of the income that you make monthly and annually, you got to make sure that those payments don't go over the 43% debt to income ratio. So your payment amount per month divided by your income amount is what your debt to income would be. And that ratio needs to be 43% or less. Okay. And that's a little bit, uh, uh, that's kind of hard for most people to understand, but I would be happy to help somebody. But on the credit report, the most crucial thing is past dues, delinquencies, foreclosures, and collection items. This majorly impacts your credit score. So those other two things, they do impact it, but it's, it's, it's less minimal. Your payment history is the most crucial thing, Diane, and that's why I always lead into that one last because I want people to really know how important it is for them to pay their bills on time, to make sure that they uh, have a good history with the people that you're already borrowing money with. So your past due collections and so forth. And we do understand that, that, that things do happen. Um, COVID-19, <laughs> you know, every 90 years, something like this has occurred and it could result in a restaurant owner not being able to operate the restaurant business the way they did pre-COVID-19. We understand that, you know, there may be less cash there, but you need to try to make the best you can do on preventing past due and collection items. You know, I've had several people ask me about different things. We might could even do a whole um, webinar on credit just because, yeah. You know, for instance, if somebody's looking for a mortgage, they, there's a couple of really great mortgage calculators out there online. But I think people struggle with the debt to income ratio because they're like, is it net? Is it gross? Does it include, 
you know, my 401k or my medical or my dental or, you know, they're not sure what the number is and how to figure that out. And so people struggle with, I think, the equations that go into some of those things. That's right. And, you know, just to make it real brief, uh, the debt to income ratio, the the way most financial institutions uh, use it, it, it is your gross income. So all those other things that you talked about, your 401k and some of those other things that you take out um, after your gross income, uh, we go off of of gross income predominantly in in the financial industry. And what about um, medical collections? That's one I get asked about a lot too, because that seems to be the hardest thing, the easiest thing to go into collections, the hardest thing to pay off or make payment arrangements on. Well, Um, you know, you're exactly right, Diane, because, um, you know, it's the easiest thing to get into because uh, most providers or hospitals and so forth, they will quickly move that off their books to a collection agency. So the biggest thing whenever you're pulling uh, credit and you may not recognize the name that has a line item out there is more than likely you had a service rendered at a healthcare professional, they moved it to collections, collection now owns it. So t- sometimes it could be of, uh, who do I pay? Right. You know, you got to figure out who you pay and pulling that credit report through uh, Credit Karma or uh, free credit report will help you in understanding who it is that you pay to get that off your collection items. But you're exactly right. We do see a lot of collection items through that, that conduit. Yeah, I've had people ask me about those quite a bit. Um, So that's a really great overview on how some of that works. Um, Because the rest of the question was disqualifiers. Like, what does the bank look at as a disqualifier? Um, So I think you covered that when you were talking about the different different pieces of it. And I I do... um, I do really highly recommend Credit Karma because they break it into those four categories that you were discussing and show you your percentages. And it's just a really great tool. Um, It it is a good tool. And you get to use it once a year. You can go out there and do it once a year. Or you can pay for the service to where you can have it ongoing, especially if you're repairing your credit. You can actually see when you do something how it does help the impact of your credit score. Well, and I think, too, one of the suggestions that I had heard um, before was, like, every quarter, take one of the different agencies and pull your free report from, like, Equifax or TransUnion. Or, and if you do it, you know, you rotate who you pull it from, that'll cover you for the, for the year so you can kind of keep up if you need to check it. If you're, if you're working towards credibility and bankability with, with a bank. So, um, Diane, that's perfect advice. That's, it. that's exactly what we, we tell them to do as well. So that's awesome. Well, John, I think that's all the questions that we have in the chat box. This has been a really um, informational webinar, and we're looking forward to having this as a tool, as I know you are too, uh, for all of us to be able to use it. Um, This was a great uh, wrap-up to our sessions. We've had some really great presenters, um, some really great partners um, through the SBTDC and through the Small Business Center and through all of our our folks here, some of our members. Um, So thank you for presenting today. Thank you for wrapping up our sessions. And for folks who are watching this um, after the fact next week, we will start back up October 1st. And um, we will have a, another round of sessions for October and November. So, John, thank you. Um, thank you for being here today, and thank you for presenting and sharing all this information. I know it was time out of your day to prepare and time out of your day to be here, so we really appreciate it. Well, Diane, thank you. I really appreciate you and Susan giving me the opportunity to uh, do this video because uh, our economy is being impacted and our small business owners are being impacted. So I really do appreciate you giving me the opportunity to present because not only is it going to help me and my clients whenever I share the video, but hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll help the overall economy of the county. Uh, so whenever somebody goes in there for a small business loan, they're more, more prepared uh, with their financial partner. So Diane, thank you. I do appreciate it. Thanks, John. I appreciate you. Bye-bye. See you later.